Good evening, my name is Carolyn Klauba. I'm the Stewardship Program Coordinator for the Sourland Conservancy. Today I'm with Rachel Mako of Wildwood Plants and she's gonna be talking to us about deer resistant native plants and the work that they do here at Wildbridge. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm glad to be talking to you today and I'm very excited to be collaborating here with the Sourland Conservancy. The Sourlands area was where we started our nursery so we're wild ridge plants before we were on the sourland ridge and now we're here on one of the ridges of the highlands region of northern new jersey we're in warren county right now so i'll be talking today about deer resistant plants and first thing to think about is when you're planting a deer resistant plant and you're working from a list a list might come from a place where the deer don't prefer certain species and you'll talk to one gardener and they'll say, the deer never eat my echinacea. The deer never eat my bee balm. And then someone else will say, they devour it and they love it. So again, when you're working from one of those lists, just keep in mind that you may find that deer eat something in your area and not in your friend's garden. Another thing to keep in mind is in June, the fawns, start moving around a lot more and they'll sample things that otherwise when they're full grown they wouldn't try but it's their first go and they're trying things and they might try things so if you're planting something new I suggest always putting a fence around it if you can a woven wire hoop or spraying it with deer off just to keep those early leaves that are nice and tender free of the fawns browsing it. So we're here at Wild Ridge, we're outside the fence. And I wanted to start off here because we have a few different deer resistant plants. Some of these might not be deer resistant in your neighborhood, but this is what we have out here. And I'll start with one of our woody plants. This is bayberry, Morella pennsylvanica. Interesting thing about this plant is there are male and females and you need to have them fruiting and flowering to be able to tell one from the other. So the females get these beautiful little waxy berries that are used for bay candles. So again, bay berry, very pretty hedgerow plant. This is a plant that is very forgiving. I've seen it in edges of moist meadows at nature preserves in Hopewell. And I've also seen these in the back dunes along the New Jersey coast. So you can see a variety of drainages. There comes one of my neighbors down the street. Mm -hmm. And the next plant I'll talk about is not quite blooming yet, but this is one of our native solidagos. This is showy goldenrod. This is deer resistant. It puts on these big, tall, yellow, starry blooms that you might get visitation from the monarch butterflies and other pollinators late in the season. It's a very late bloomer. It blooms alongside of New England aster. Very nice showy plant. Also showy are our perennial sunflowers. This is one of several different species. Now this is Helianthus stromosus. Again, it's perennial. It's not like a garden sunflower that sets seed and dies at the end of the growing season. This comes back from perennial rootstock year after year. Has these nice coarse leaves. And I would say if you were in a very high deer area, I would be cautious about planting this one because they may browse it. Here, they don't, the deer don't browse it, but I have a different helianthus planted on the corner of the fence in a high deer traffic area, and they are browsing it. Mother Nature is conspiring to bring us some rain. Fingers crossed that we won't get any. Oddly enough, because of the lay of land, we often get storms often go right by us. So again, if you go with one of these sunflowers, and there, this is Helianthus stromosus, this likes moister soils. There's Helianthus divaricatus, and that likes drier soils. And then there's um, other Helianthus species, and they can be planted in different areas. 
This is a wonderful goldfinch feeder. They will be all over these, picking the seeds. Also kind of in this mix is one of our mountain mint species. This is hoary mountain mint. This area is partly shaded here. So this helianthus and this mountain mint, hoary mountain mint, both like a touch of shade. They can do also full sun and they're totally fine. Hoary mountain mint likes excellent drainage and this is a fabulous plant for pollinators, bumblebees, solitary bees, and also, I have to say, wasps. And I'll give a shout out to wasps. Wasps are amazing creatures. When they are foraging, typically they are not interested in people. When they are defending their nest, they can be aggressive. But if you are planting and you have wasps and bees in your yard, Generally, they're just doing their job and they're eating. Kind of like you or me, when we're eating, don't really like to be interrupted. So you'll be fine sharing your garden with those little creatures. Here I'll also kind of point out, if we get a little bit of a wide angle view, we have as a screen, our house, you may or may not be able to see it from the video, but our house is pretty much right along the road. So we have a screen of coral honeysuckle that's growing up the fence with a little foundation here of the purple flowering raspberry. It's really large foliage raspberry. And here we go. Here's one of the fruits. Two of the fruits. Yeah, too bad it's coronavirus time, so we can't all have a big feast together. So these are edible. And I would say that if you plant another one of these, in high deer area, you will probably have to fence them. These plants are just kind of coming over and through the fence. But I do want to show you some other exciting deer resistant plants. So here we have another beautiful deer resistant species. This is swamp rose mallow. This is hibiscus mashudos. I don't know if you'll be able to see on the video, but it is loaded with pollen and um, hummingbirds will visit this plant. This is a plant here, we've got it planted on the edge of our septic system, but it is a plant that grows emergent in waters. You might find it along the Delaware Canal. You might find it in moist, very, very moist sections of meadow. And, but here we have it basically planted into very poor soil, it's very bony, it's very rocky. And so when you're looking at plant descriptions, you can remain wedded to them, but you can also play around. A lot of the plants have a lot of flexibility because remember you're gardening, right? So you're there, you're caretaking for the plants as opposed to where this plant naturally occurs because that's where it's really competitive. It's not competitive in a dry meadow because there's so many plants that do a great job at that. But in your drier garden, this plant might be just fine because you're there adding a little extra compost, you've watered it when it's been planted. So you have a lot more play, a lot more flexibility. I wanna point out that this is nice pink color. We also, will have this, will naturally have variations within the species. Sometimes the petals are uh, white. Sometimes they're an even deeper pink than this. They bloom for about one or two days each bloom. And then they close up, set seeds, and then the next one will bloom. So they kind of grow as big as a shrub. However, this is a perennial herb, and by that mean, I mean, that has roots that come back every year. You don't need to replant it, so it comes back up. But the above ground parts are herbaceous, meaning they die every year and then sprout again in the spring. This likes warm weather or long days. It's tuned to something because it emerges late. So if you plant this now in the summer or in fall, just know that next year in the spring, you might not see it until late spring. So don't be worried, don't think that it didn't come back, but just know that 
plants like this one, plants like orange milkweed, Asclepias tuberosa, they also like the warm weather and don't come back at the first uh, break of winter. So again, hibiscus mashudos, one of our native hibiscus species, really beautiful and well behaved in the garden. This plant right here is wild bergam bergamot, wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa. It likes full sun, high and dry meadows. So if you have a dry, hot spot in front of your house, this plant is great. This is also a really wonderful plant that attracts tons of butterflies, large butterflies, swallowtails, monarchs, also the daytime flying moths, the hummingbird clearwing moths, which are a delight to watch. So here it's kind of seeded in on our septic system. The leaves are highly aromatic, and that is one reason why the deer don't like it. If, if you have this plant and you smell it, it basically smells like the leaves of thyme, the culinary herb. And um, you can see in and around it, we've got some Japanese stiltgrass popping up. And I won't touch too much on invasive species, but one thing that native species do over non-native species is they have many, many biological links with the soil, with the insects, birds, mammals, who need these plants. And things like lawns and things like garden roses may be attractive to us, but they're really not attractive to wildlife. And so if we can have a gardening philosophy of being open, willing, sharing with wildlife, as well as maybe a little bit less concerned about weeds, I think we will have success. And if we redefine success as replanting, welcoming wildlife back in, welcoming a different palette of plants back into our lives, then we've succeeded. If we want to get rid of every single invasive plant, if we want to have gardens without weeds, then we might set ourselves up for failure. In fact, when I have people come over here and they say, I'm so excited to come see your gardens, I basically correct them and say, I'm looking forward to you coming here too. I don't really have gardens. What I have are restorations. Because then that allows me to kind of be constantly tinkering with more natives, less non-natives, not perfection. I'm never really seeking perfection. Sure, I, I would like perfection. I would like a completely weed-free property, but that is a very high standard. And I welcome you to let that go if you can. I'm trying. And so you'll see as we walk through, you'll see non-native plants. You might see exotic plants and we all have them. And really what we're just doing is constantly tipping the balance in favor of the natives, in favor of the plants that the wildlife need. So one of the things we do at Wild Ridge is we collect our own seed. We don't buy in seed and we don't buy in plants, but we collect seed from local ecotypes, from local wild open pollinated plants. And what I mean by ecotype is it's local to an area. It might be a native plant, like say Joe Pie here is native in many states in our region. But if I get a plant, say from Georgia or from New Hampshire, those plants are timed to that climate condition. They're timed to that day length, that spring, breaking of the frost and things like that. So local ecotype plants are highly tuned to your climate. So when you get a local ecotype plant, you're basically planting something that has sort of a chemical or DNA memory of emerging at the right time and blooming timed with when the pollinators will fly. And I think that's 
an important thing to consider when you're planting your native garden. I think it's not something that is 100% essential. And if you get a plant from Ohio or you get a plant from North Carolina, you're still doing something good by planting a native plant, but by planting something super local, again, it's tuned to your environment. So this is Joe Pye weed, Eutrochium fistulosum. There's a few different other Joe Pye species. And actually I'd like to simply call it Joe Pye instead of Joe Pye weed because it's, could this possibly be a weed with this beautiful bumblebee right here and all the butterflies dancing around? It basically looks like a flowering cotton candy. This mm. is something that I would say if you had someone who in your neighborhood, you want to get them to replace a butterfly bush. This is a great plant to plant because it blooms at about the same time as butterfly bush. And it is just filled with nectaring insects. Insects will also use the hollow stems and will lay their eggs and overwinter in the stems. It's one reason why I might encourage you if you're gardening to leave certain sections of your garden wild throughout the whole winter because you might have overwintering beneficial insects inside the stems of your plants. So if you have an area that you can leave untidy, consider doing that. That's a nice thing to do for the insects. These will also be covered with juncos and other seed eating birds as these uh, flowers go to seed and so then you're basically feeding the next group of wildlife to come through. So one thing that we haven't talked about are plants that don't flower, at least don't flower in the way that we think of flowers. We haven't talked about our graminoids, so we haven't talked about grasses sedges and rushes, and those tend to be deer resistant. Deer tend to be browsers, not grazers, like cows graze. Deer browse, go from place to place, and they tend to not eat grasses. And sometimes people say, oh, well, grasses aren't that exciting. Well, grasses have a lot of dynamic characteristics that we could talk about. One is their architecture. So when we take a long view of this area, you will see the linear aspects of this plant where many of the flowering plants that you might have in your garden go like this. They have horizontal shelves of foliage. Well, this has this beautiful linear shape and it can be really kind of fun from a design perspective. These are also architectural, meaning here they are competing with this wild bergamot here, causing the wild bergamot to be a lot shorter than it might be if it was growing by itself. So therefore it doesn't flop over. So it's a, grass is our nice garden companion. The other thing about native grasses is that their hollow stems can be areas where insects lay eggs and overwinter. They can be habitat for a variety of different insects. Queen bees may use the tussocks as shelter for overwintering or creating a nest. And again, they're just beautiful. They also provide seeds for birds. And I encourage anybody who's gardening to consider grasses because there are so many different ways to use them. If you are a very formal person, they could be planted in rows. And I've seen beautiful designs outside of outdoor shops where they've done these really elegant designs using native grasses. This one here in particular is the little blue stem. It'll turn a beautiful coppery color in late fall and it'll remain standing throughout the winter. So the grasses like this, one are really wonderful three season interest winter interest so it's something worth considering there's also indian grass which also is rather beautiful as a different form it's taller there's cool season grasses like bottle brush grass which likes a touch of shade this is a warm season grass and by that i mean 
it's basically just taking off now. And here we are in, in mid-August and it's finally gotten tall for a very long time. It was just a few inches tall and it's just shooting up now as the summer gets hotter and hotter. Bottle brush grass, on the other hand, will bloom in June and it is a cool season grass so it likes cooler temperatures. Thank you so much, Rachel, for having us here. Can you share with people where they can learn more about Wild Ridge and the work that you're doing? Sure, so if you would like to visit us online, you can go to wildridgeplants.com. We have a robust website where you can look up many of the plants that we talked about here today and learn a little bit more about them. You can also follow us on various social media or you can get in touch on email and you can email nursery at wildridgeplants.com. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for being here with us today.